have your Bibles tonight, turn with us to the book of Genesis, chapter number uh, 18. Genesis, chapter number 18 tonight. I want us just to look for just a few minutes at an idea or a thought of God's people <clears throat> standing in the gap for others. You know, had it not been for somebody standing in the gap, none of us here tonight would have any hope. Some of us here tonight might still be lost had somebody not stood in the gap for us. What, is, what does it mean to stand in the gap? Well, if you think about a city, in those days, cities there were surrounded by walls. They had walls built around the cities, and this was for uh, the safety and the protection of those within the city to protect the city. If it did not have a wall, or if there was a breach in the wall, or a gap, or a hole in the wall, the city would fall. We find in how that Nehemiah, God burdened his heart to go to Jerusalem and repair the wall there at Jerusalem because without the wall, the city stood no chance. And it, like I said, if there was a gap or a hole in the wall and it was left unrepaired or unattended to, then the enemy could very easily sneak in or come in through there and overtake the city. Now, keeping that idea in our mind, in our life, there's a gap in our life. Before salvation, there was a gap in every one of our lives. There was a gap between us and God. There was an empty space. There was a, a void space between us and God. And Jesus Christ stood in the gap for each and every one of us. But not only did Jesus stand in the gap, there was somebody somewhere that was praying for you and I. There was somebody that was praying for John Grimes whenever he was young. I, I believe it was probably my mama and my daddy and my grandma uh, and all. But uh, there was somebody that was praying for me. There was somebody that was praying for you. Somebody was standing in the gap and, and making intercession with the Father for you. Whenever that time, uh, whenever uh, uh, before we were saved. We find in the book of Genesis here, and this is not the only place that you can find uh, the idea or find somebody standing in the gap for others. But in Genesis chapter number 18, we find the, the man of God, Abraham, standing in the gap, if you will, for the people of Sodom. Now, you would think that that is an evil place. Sodom was a one of the most evil, wicked places upon the earth. And, and we know that God did destroy them, but before God destroyed them, He, he sent word to Abraham that He was going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And I want you to notice what Abraham did for those people. Now we preached the other week about uh, Jonah excuse me, and the people of Nineveh, even though they may have been enemies of God and, and they were Assyrians and Gentiles and, and they, uh, 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 Jonah didn't care for them. We're talking about people in Sodom, people that uh, Abraham may not have cared for because of the lifestyle and because of the wickedness there in the city. But we see that the man of God stood in the gap and made intercession with God the Father on the behalf of those people. Let's begin reading in chapter number 18 and verse number 22. If you would, let's stand tonight as we read the Word of God. I want to point a few things to you tonight. The Bible says this, And the men, these men were the angels of the Lord, or the angels of God. We can see it a little bit earlier there in the chapter. It says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before God. Thank God for people that will stand before God on the behalf of others. Amen? Amen. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Her adventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? 
that be, that be far from thee to do the, uh, after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure thou shalt lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou, also, uh, wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure thou shalt be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for the forty's sake. And he said unto, uh, unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure thou shalt be thirty, uh, shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it, destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Father, we ask you to bless your word tonight. Lord God, I ask you to help us as we look at your word, Lord. Give us the things to say. Dear God, you know the hearts of those here. Lord God, the message that we need. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us, dear God, to to listen to your message, listen to your word, take it, apply it to our heart, apply it to our life each and every day that we might be a better and more useful vessel for you. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We find here, go ahead and be seated, we find here, God has come to Abraham, or sent word to Abraham that he's going to destroy the city of Sodom. And Abraham bargains with the Lord. And basically, he says, and I know that God is not in a deal-making God, but I think one of the reasons that God went along with Abraham was to prove a point to him that he was still in control and that he still knew. That God is an all-knowing God, and he knew the hearts and the minds of the people there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, yeah, okay, I'll, uh, I'll go along with you, Abraham. If I find 50 people there that are righteous, I'll, I'll spare the city. And then Abraham said, what about 45? And God said, well, yeah, if there's only 45, I won't destroy it for 45. And Abraham pushed, his, pushed the agenda a little bit more and said, what about 40? And God said, no, I'll, I'll spare it for 40. I won't, I won't destroy it. And he went on down to 30. And then he got down to 20. And then he got down to 10. And the Lord said, that's enough. If I find 10 righteous people there, I won't destroy it. And he left. He left the conversation. God went his way and Abraham went his way. Now, we know the account of what happened. Either there were not 10 righteous people to be found in Sodom could not find ten righteous people. Now how big do you think Sodom was? I had to do a little research on this. How big do you think the city of Sodom was? Was it about the size of Loosedale? And you think about a city being the size of Loosedale, it's not a very big city, but whenever, in those days, that's a pretty big city. city of Loosedale. Oh no. Sodom was much larger. Sodom, from what I can find, what I have... Uh, researched and come up with Sodom was bigger than the city of Mobile. Mobile is 180 square miles. Sodom was 200 square miles. There's a That's a big city in those days. That is a huge city. It's a big city in the today's standard, you know. There's not, there's not a city in the state of Mississippi that big. But a, a 200 square mile city. Now, I don't know what the population of Mobile is, but I'm guessing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 or so thousand people in the city of Mobile. 
I know the city of Jackson runs about 175 or 170,000 people. There's been a few thousand people departed out of the city of Jackson over the years. It used to be about 180,000. Well, I'm guessing Mobile's probably got about 250,000 people in the city of Mobile. It would be like going to the city of Mobile and trying to find ten righteous people, Brother Dennis. You would think that you could find ten righteous people in the city of Mobile. And I'm not saying that you can't, but I'm just, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you of what it... You know, surely Abraham's thinking... There's got to be ten righteous folks there. Out of all them people, there's got to be at least ten that love God. There's got to be ten that live for the Lord. I mean, for crying out loud, my nephew is there and his family is there. There's got to be at least ten. Well, we know that just because Lot was there and his family was there, still could not find ten righteous people in the city of Sodom. And we know that God did destroy the city of Sodom, the Moor, and the cities of the plain. But standing in the gap was Abraham. Now, I'm pretty certain that Abraham was concerned for his nephew. I'm pretty certain that Abraham was concerned for his extended family, if you will, that was there in Sodom. And he was willing to stand before God, as it says there, I think in verse 22 or so, that he stood there before God and talked with, uh, with God to try to spare the city. I want to ask you this question tonight. Are you yourself willing to stand in the gap for somebody else to, to intercede on their behalf? I may mention the other week that we ought to be praying for folks Maybe the folks that we don't like, maybe folks in our family, we ought to be praying for them because they're not going to pray for themselves. Somebody needs to be praying for them. You can rest assured that the people in Sodom were not going before the throne of God. We know this because of the wickedness there. Listen, and because you could not find ten righteous people in that city. They were not honoring God. They were not worshiping God. They were not serving God. But yet Abraham was willing to stand before God on their behalf. This is not the only time that we can find a, a person of God or a man of God or somebody that belongs to the Lord God. We, we, this is not the first time that we can find in the Bible where these people are willing to stand and to call out to God on the behalf of somebody else. Listen, you're talking about a good attribute or characteristic of the child of God. How about interceding uh, 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 to God for somebody else? How often do we practice that? How often do we pray for others? It's, it's fairly easy to pray for church folks. It's fairly easy to pray for family members and people that we know. It's pretty easy to do that. But what about those people that we don't know? I mentioned a while ago about praying for the Trump family and the passing of the president's brother and praying for the president and his family and, and those that was are, are there in the family during this loss of their, their family member. We don't know them. I've never met them. The only president I've ever met is George Bush, the, the son, W. But we don't know who these people are, but yet we are we willing to pray for them? Or do we just stick to those people that we know? I'm pretty certain the honest people in Sodom that Abraham knew was probably Lot and his family. But yet he said, Lord, please don't destroy those people. I have an idea in mind that Abraham knew of the wickedness that was there in Sodom and he wanted the Lord to be merciful and gracious to those people. And not destroy them. Give them opportunity to turn from their wickedness and turn from their ways and, and turn to God. But we see that he, he, what, he tried to make some sort of a, a, a deal, if you will, with God. That hey, if there's just ten righteous people, don't destroy the city. God said, okay. We know the outcome of it. Are we willing to stand in the gap like Abraham? Listen, there's a, a verse of Scripture over in the book of Ezekiel. Over in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 22. 
See if I can find this real quick. Ezekiel chapter number 22. Verse number 30. Do we, and I hate to use the word obligation, but do we have a responsibility to stand in the gap for the wicked? Yes, we do. I believe that we do. I believe we have a responsibility as born again saved people to intercede for the wicked. Okay? Now, in Ezekiel chapter number 22, verse number 30, the Bible says this, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. Out of mine indignation, upon, uh, poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. We're talking about the, the priests and the, the princes and the prophets there of the children of Israel and, and how that God was looking for somebody to stand in the gap. And He found no one that was willing to stand in the gap and make a hedge about uh, God's people and, and, and to do the things that, that, that God would have them do. That he, he, God couldn't find anybody to do that. And He destroyed them. God wants us to be the man, to be the person, to make up the hedge, to make up the wall, if you will, and stand in the gap before me. What does that mean? It's kind of like this right here. Not only are we responsible for praying for the wicked, we're also responsible for praying for the saved. To make up the hedge means to build a wall. It's what a hedge basically is, is a wall. And remember we said a while ago at the beginning of this that, that a wall is representative of security and protection and, and keeping the enemy out and keeping those things that are unwanted out. That's the reason that you know, uh, 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 building the wall uh, on our southern border to keep those out that should not be here. That's the purpose of a wall is to keep things out that are not supposed to be in. Okay? Now, the Lord was looking for somebody to build a hedge, to stand in the gap, somebody to help protect the saved. Now, I'm trying to explain this without confusing people to death. <clears throat> we said that the wall purpose was for protection. That's what God is wanting us to do. Brother Dennis, there might be a person that's saved, but they may not be a prayer warrior. They may not be one that prays all the time. They might need somebody to, to create a hedge or to be in prayer for them, to pray for them and intercede for them that God would keep them safe and that God would keep the hand of the devil off. Are we willing to do that? We find so many times in our churches that, yes, we're, we say that we're willing to pray for one another, but we don't. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard preachers preach and I've seen or heard people talk about how, well, preacher, would you pray for me? We'll be praying for you. Never pray for It's kind of like the prayer request on the bulletin there. How many of us pray for that? Listen, there's nothing wrong with taking that bulletin and laying it down before us as we kneel in prayer and to pray over these people and call their names out individually to God and pray for them. God knows what, who they are. God knows what their need is. But yet we ought to stand in the gap and pray for those individuals and, 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 and intercede to God for them. We have a responsibility to do that. Even for the wicked, you have a responsibility to pray for them. The book of Psalm, if I can find it real quick. The book of Psalm. I'm trying to find, hold on. Let me 
Psalms chapter 106. We find another instance. The psalmist writes, and you can actually find the account over in the book of Exodus. Over in the book of Exodus. Remember when the children of Israel had come out of Israel. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had gone through the, the desert and things of this nature. And they got to Mount Sinai. And Moses went up on the mountain. Was up there for 40 days. And how the people grew restless. And the people went to Aaron and said that apparently Moses ain't coming back. He's dead or something. But he ain't coming back. Aaron, you make us a, 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 a golden calf. And that's what he did. They made a golden calf and the people of Israel, the children of Israel, began to dance around and, and worship that idol. And, and they began to practice idol worship there. And, and, and we see that Moses came down because he heard the noise that was going on down there. And God told him what was going on. And God was about to destroy the entire nation of Israel. The whole bunch of them that come out of the, uh, that come out of bondage there in Egypt. God was about to destroy them for their idolatry, but we find that Moses says, please Lord, don't do that. You promised a great nation. Don't destroy them. Notice what it says in Psalms 106 verse number 23. He says, therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath lest he should destroy them. Listen, sometimes God may have on his mind to destroy the wicked. Sometimes, we, and I know that's hard for us to fathom that God would do such a thing. If God would destroy the city of Sodom for their wickedness, if He was ready to destroy the children of Israel for their idolatry, if He was willing to destroy the priests and the prophets and the princes uh, that, because they wouldn't do what God would have them do. Listen, who's to say that He won't destroy somebody today? God is the same today as He was then. God has not changed at all. God still requires God's people to stand in the gap and stand before God and be in prayer for them. That God would be merciful and not destroy them. God was ready to destroy these folks had Moses not stood in the gap. He said, no, Lord, please don't do that. Don't let your anger be kindled. Don't let your anger wax hot against these people. These are your people. They ain't so bad. These are your people. Listen, God knew the hearts of these people. God knew them. I mean, after all, there ain't nothing that God don't know. There ain't no one, there, or there isn't anyone, that God does not know. Okay? He knows all. And He knows our hearts. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the very hairs on our head, the numbers of them, Brother Dennis. You've been praying a lot of attention. <laughs> it's almost as if he's counting backwards, huh? Yeah. But we find that that there are those that are willing to stand in the gap for those that are not willing to pray for themselves. And who is that that is willing to stand in the gap? Those are God's people, God's men, those that are righteous, if you will. Listen. You and I have a responsibility to stand in that gap. Are we fulfilling our responsibility to pray for others the way that we should? As I said earlier, it's easy to pray for family. It's easy to pray for friends. It's easy to pray for fellow church people. But what about those wicked people? That drug dealer down on the corner. That prostitute down on the corner. That child abuser down on the corner. Or down the street. That sex offender that lives down the street. It's hard to pray for them people. I know it. 
because we let ourselves get in the way. We let our flesh get in the way. We still ought to be praying for them. We still ought to be interceding for them. Because if, if we don't, we're going to be destroyed. How are they going to be destroyed? Is, is God going to strike them down? He could. If He saw a mind too, He could strike them down. But I'll tell you this, they'll be destroyed in the lake of fire in the pits of hell forever and ever. If somebody don't stand in the gap and pray for them and pray that the Lord would save them, they're going to be destroyed that way for sure. They'll not have eternal life and glory. Are we praying for those that that are standing in the need of prayer. It's kind of like that song we used to sing. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. There's not a person here tonight that's not standing in the need of prayer. But I wonder how many of us here tonight are willing to stand and meet that need of prayer and pray for the other. Pray for that one that is in need of prayer. Preacher, who is that person that is standing in the need of prayer? Look around you. Look around you. We all are standing in the need of prayer. We ought to be fulfilling our responsibility. Going before God on behalf of somebody else. I pray that this message tonight will help us in our prayer life. This message would help us in our daily life, our walk with God. I pray that this message would help us, that we take it and apply it to our life. You know, any message that is preached, anything that we read in the Word of God, any of that stuff. It does no good if we do not apply it. We can know the, every single word in the Word of God by heart. We can, if we could quote all 66 books of the Bible, that would be great. But what's even better, it's not going to do us any good to quote it if we don't store it in our heart and live it in our life. We don't take it and apply it. It does no good. You can go get you some skeeter spray it, put it on the shelf at the house. It ain't gonna do you no good unless you spray it on. You have to apply it to you. Keep the skeeters off. Same thing with the word of God. You have to apply it in our life. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for your word. Well, God, I ask and pray tonight that you'd help us to be more considerate of others and their needs, dear God. If we pray for them, Lord. Father, I, I ask you to help us tonight to be more in tune with your will. That God would be more inclined to stand in the gap for others. Many times, Lord, people let their lives get too busy. I don't have time to stand in the gap and pray for everybody. I've got just enough time to pray for myself. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make the time to pray for others. Be willing, dear God, not forced, but dear God, that you would compel our hearts to stand in the gap and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but dear God, that you would also compel our hearts to pray for the wicked. Pray for the lost, dear God. Pray for that one down the road that we may not care too much for. Lord God, I ask you to help us to have the kind of heart that our Savior has. Dear God, that we would be willing to stand in the gap. We'd be willing to build a hedge, dear God, around your people. I'm going to ask you to help us. We know that prayer works. We've seen it work, dear God. Father, we know that prayer is a useful tool. 
that is a useful weapon for the child of God. Lord, I pray you'd help us to use it wisely. Lord, and frankly, dear God, that we would use it often. Father, I ask you to go with us now as we depart from this place. Give traveling grace to those traveling. Lord God, that you would bring us back safely at the next appointed time. Once again, we thank you for the ones that we've heard this morning that we that come to know Christ as their Savior. Dear God, we once again, we give you all the honor and the glory, dear God. We thank you for it. We thank you for that victory in that lot. Lord, I ask and pray that you would help us now as we try to lead your sheep, your flock, dear God. Give us understanding and give us ability and wisdom, Lord, to lead the direction you have us to go. I ask you, Lord, to help me to be more of a prayer warrior in my life. We love you and praise you and thank you, dear God, once again for all that you do. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate you being here tonight.